once around Leuton's star. So this little star, also known as Gliese 273, is a small faint star that you can't see unless you have a decent pair of binoculars or more likely a, a reasonable telescope because it's rather faint, magnitude 9.9, .9, well below the magnitude 6 for a the naked eye and probably beyond even a small pair of binoculars. It sits in the constellation of Canis Minor, the small dog, which is made up of, well, fundamentally a line joining two stars. I'm not quite sure how you make a dog out of that, but uh, you've got Procyon there, the alpha star, and then the beta star marked just above the position of Leuton's star. Now, the Gliese catalogue, that's a catalogue of red dwarf stars. And so it's obvious that that's what this is going to be. And a distance fairly near the sun, just 12.35 light years away. It was named after the discoverer, William Jacob Leuken, and he spotted it moving across the background of stars, the so-called proper motion, always a clue to the fact that the star must be fairly nearby, back in 1935. So what we know about it now is that it is considerably smaller than the sun. It's a class M 3.5 star with just 25% of the sun's mass. Now, that makes it fairly well in the middle of the range of red dwarf stars. They go from the smallest possible ordinary star at about 7.5% of the sun's mass up to about 60%. And then we have a rather narrower range that a class K, the orange dwarfs, 60 to 90 percent. After that, they become G class. And of course, that's where we find the sun at 100 percent. But this 25 percent cutoff actually really should be a separate class all of its own, because below 25 percent of the sun's mass the stars are fully convective, so that means they entirely stir all of the contents of their cores up through out into the outer layers and back again, and are therefore able to use all the available hydrogen. Above 25%, they stop being able to do that, and so they will inevitably have some hydrogen left in the outer regions of the star by the time they come to their eventual uh, end of life. So really, the classifications need a bit of updating here, I think. Temperature, 3150 Kelvin, so red hot. Definitely a red dwarf, but we really ought to have two classes of them above and below 25%. Anyway, I said it was uh, about 12 light years away, and here's a little sort of schematic with the sun in the centre, the Oort cloud of comets around it. And then out at about four light years, we've got Alpha Centauri, uh, AB, and Proxima. And then other stars. And you can see uh, I've talked about some of these in other videos. In fact, I've talked about all of them. Ross 128, Arcturus, Formaholt, and uh, Altair. So here's Lutjen's star off to the left-hand side there as the, the red dot. Now... It's passed us by already. It, about 13,000 years ago, it made its closest approach to the sun on, well, at least on this lap of the galaxy. For So for another 250 million years before it probably uh, stands a chance of coming anywhere near us again. Of course, by then, both the sun and Lutjen's star will have uh, been perturbed and likely on a different orbit. In space, its nearest neighbour is in fact Procyon, so the line of sight of putting it in Canis Minor is uh, not entirely unfair. It's actually just within 1.2 light years of Procyon at roughly the same distance. I think Procyon is just a little bit nearer. And we uh, can imagine being on a planet around Leuton's star and you would see Procyon very bright, minus 4.5 for the magnitude. So rather like Venus shining in the uh, sky from our point of view. Whereas the other way around, if you were on a planet orbiting Procyon, you'd still be able to see Leuton star plus 4.6 for the magnitude. So it would be uh, a faintish star. 
um, that reflects really the massive difference in the power output of these two stars, Procyon, more massive than the sun, getting on for twice its mass, burning away furiously, whereas Luchin's star, a quarter of the sun's mass and running at a very cool temperature and low output as a result. Now, not only is it interesting because it's nearby, but because we have confirmed some planets. So two of them are known to be there for sure, B and C, and they're roughly speaking Earth-like planets. B is 2.9 times the Earth's mass and a little larger, and it's 10 times closer to the star than the Earth is to the Sun, just going round in an 18-day long orbit. And as a result of that closer proximity to a rather more feeble star, it's getting almost 100%, 1.06 times the heat that we do here on Earth from the Sun. So that very much puts this in the habitable zone. And so it's another example of one of the Sun's near neighbours in space having habitable zone Earth-like planets. Planet C, or even more Earth-like in mass, 1.2 times our own, but being closer in and whizzing around every 4.7 days, uh, that's going to make it quite warm. Um, it's uh, sufficiently close, really, that this is going to be a hothouse planet. And we also have two candidates, D and E, for larger planets, super Earths, maybe uh, mini Neptunes, at 11 and 9.3 times the Earth's masses. And you can see the orbital periods there, several hundred days each further out. So this is quite a, a nice, interesting star system, four planets probably, and I bet there are more when we come to being able to detect them, because we're still not really finding very many planets that are smaller uh, than the Earth in terms of mass. There is an interesting relationship between B and C, that is that um, the orbital periods are in exact lockstep, four to one, and that's a situation that we find with the moons of Jupiter, for example, Io, Europa, and Ganymede are in a one to two to four orbital resonance. And this is, of course, a great stabilizing factor in terms of keeping their orbits doing the same thing each time as they keep getting these repeated nudges. So very interesting system indeed, and so much so that we have beamed a deliberate radio signal to it. The uh, project Sonar Calling, GJ for Gliese Catalog 273B. In October of 2017, the METI project and the Sonar Music Festival in Barcelona in Spain combined to create and beam a radio message out to Leuten's star using the dish shown on the right there in Norway at Ramafjorden. And um, this consisted of a mathematical tutorial in order to suggest how to decode the rest of the message, plus a number of messages and indeed some music from the music festival. Quite what the aliens are going to make of the music, I don't know. And um, we'll have to wait until 2040 for the reply at the earliest possible time. If there's anyone there who happens to receive this message, pick it up, work out what it's for and where it was from, and they send a message back. Well, the round trip time for a beam of radio waves from Earth all the way out to uh, Leuten's star, Gliese 273, and planet B and back will take us up to 2042. So uh, maybe I'll still be around just uh, and able to hear whether we uh, got a reply to that one. I'm not going to hold my breath. So anyway, thanks very much for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed that little whistle-stop tour of a nearby red dwarf star and its family of planets. Thanks for listening.